Well, good evening. Um, thank you for attending our now fourth seminar of this Women's Cancer Quarterly Series. I'm honored to uh, introduce myself, first of all. I am uh, the uh, director of the Division of Gynecologic Oncology here at Stanford. I joined Stanford about two years ago, and it's been really a uh, great journey so far and a terrific group of people to work with. I'm particularly uh, proud of uh, our activities in uh, clinical trials for gynecological cancers as it's so well supported by our clinical research group. We have Sharanya and Ashley and Bela here that are really responsible for the main part of this work. And uh, what I want to do today is I want to tell you a little bit about clinical trials in general. I uh, want to tell you what it means to conduct a clinical trial, what the phases are of those, and what you can benefit from, and potentially what the risks are. In the second section, I want to show you how to find clinical trials at Stanford and beyond, and particularly how we do it via the Stanford Cancer Institute and uh, websites through the National Institutes of Health. And then the third section will focus in what I think are promising new treatment strategies for our gynecological cancers, and particularly how we target specific cancer growth pathways, how we use PARP inhibitors, and how we are very excited about new developments in immunotherapy. What is a clinical trial? There's a lot of different definitions. This one is um, one that I think does fit very well in general. It is research that prospectively, so going forward, assigns human subjects to intervention and concurrent comparison control groups to study the cause and effect relationship between a medical intervention, like a drug, and a health outcome. And that really is something very general that we can apply for clinical trials in all diseases, but also fits very well for cancer disease. Why do we even need to do clinical trials? Why can't we just take a drug that has shown great efficacy and great promise in our animal models and cell lines in the laboratory and give it to patients. Well, clinical trials actually are meant to provide a scientific and systematic approach of research in human subjects that can be carried out very efficiently, ethically, and it's supposed to optimize safety as well as the potential benefit for the patient. We also have to make sure that the conclusions we reach from these trials do reach a statistically meaningful result. Without that, we can't really recommend our treatments to patients with good consciousness. There's different types of clinical trials. There are prevention trials. We have given aspirin to patients in an attempt to prevent certain cancers. There's screening and early detection trials, and some of you might have been part of screening trials for ovarian cancers, where we use ultrasound, a CN25 tumor marker, and pelvic exams on a regular basis to detect those cancers early on, none of which have shown to really uh, change the outcome of ovarian cancer patients, unfortunately. There's those trials that evaluate diagnostic procedures. We have some trials at Stanford and a very active group in radiology that investigates new PET scanning modalities. We are part of at least a couple of these studies. In addition, and particularly nowadays, there's a lot of emphasis on trials that look at quality of life and supportive care. It's very important at some point in the treatment of every cancer patients to look at whether the interventions that uh, we have at uh, their disposition do improve their quality of life and how they impact their overall lifestyle. But I think what most of you are interested in is treatment trials. Those are trials that investigate new drugs or investigate drugs that are already approved in a different combination. And those trials are supposed to make a difference for the patient. Clinical trial protocols are a very, very important part of clinical trials. What is a clinical trial protocol? It's really a written detailed action plan that sometimes goes up to 150, 200 written pages. And I know my clinical research group knows these very well. We read the you know, all details. And what it does is it does provide a background and rationale of these trials. Why is it important and why does it make sense to use a certain drug? 
It also describes the trial objectives and goals. Every trial has a different endpoint or goal. Some trials are just looking for safety. Does the patient tolerate this drug? Some other trials look for, is this drug really effective against the cancer? The clinical trial protocol outlines in great details everything you need to know to execute the trial correctly. That's the sequence of events, the design, and the requirements for enrollments. And those of you who have looked at clinical trials know very well that uh, there are very specific inclusion and exclusion criteria for each trial you might be a candidate for. Very important in these clinical protocols is an in-depth description of safety and stopping rules. We need to know at what point the drug becomes too toxic in order to continue the patient on the trial. We also need to know at what point to stop the patient in the trial when the disease progresses. That, again, all is included in the clinical trial protocol. It does include a very detailed statistical plan, and we always have statisticians that look at the numbers because it has to be statistically meaningful at the end of the trial, as I mentioned before. We as investigators, with the help of our clinical research coordinators, have to follow these clinical protocols very, very strictly. And if there's any deviations, we have to report those deviations immediately. Now, as I said, there are different phases of clinical trial. The most important phases are phase one, two, and three. What is a phase one trial? The phase one trial is when a drug or intervention is first ever administered to human beings. And it mainly is supposed to assess the safety of the drug, not so much the efficacy. Now, you might get an effect of this new drug, but that is really a secondary endpoint. Again, it is more important to know what dose the patient tolerates. We're usually starting these trials at a low dose and then slowly increase the dose to find the what we call maximum tolerated dose, and in some cases called the optimal biological dose. The groups are small. They're 20 to 25 patients first. And if it's safe, we escalate this to more patients, and it can go up to 50 to 80 patients. There is no blinding, meaning you know you're going to get the drug. It takes less than other clinical trials, about three to six months to accomplish, and the success rate of the phase one trials in general is about 70%. What that means is 70% of the drugs that we are testing are considered to be safe and rather well tolerated um, by the patient. Now, if a phase one study does not show any uh, unacceptable toxicity, we move on to these so-called phase two trials. And those trials are now are focused on, uh, again, the safety, but much on the effect of this drug in this disease. They often are controlled trials, so patients are receiving the drug, and then they're compared with very similar patients that receive a different drug treatment. And that's either a placebo or it's a drug that's already established in this situation. The trials are larger, they're 200 to 500 patients, so you have more opportunity to participate, and therefore they take more time, about six months to two years. The success rate is about 35%, meaning that in third, about a third of all these trials, the drug indeed shows some superior efficacy compared to the standard treatment and placebo. Now, when that is the case, you usually then see this as press releases, but it should move on to a phase three trial. And those are the trials that are really large. They have up to 1,000 patients, sometimes even more in them. They are done as multi-center, sometimes international trials. They're usually double-blinded. That means the physician doesn't know, and you don't know either whether you get the drug or not. We randomize patients, so we pull a number out of the hat and then allocate either a placebo, control drug, or the inter investigational drug to you. We're very careful about recording all adverse side effects and, of course, do a very detailed statistical evaluation of all the clinical data. Those are long trials. They take up to five years to accomplish. And the overall success rate is then quoted as being about 25%. So not all the development, this very expensive development, leads to approval of a drug by the FDA, but ultimately all these trials are done to make a new drug or intervention available to patients for this disease group and approved by the FDA. 
So in summary, we have three main phases of clinical trials, and I want you to be aware of this. There's a small number that are enrolled in phase one, which mainly looks at safety. We have several hundreds of patients that are enrolled in phase two trials, and more and more of those are done. And then in phase three, the large trials, longer trials that look really at, again, safety, dosage, and effectiveness. There is a phase, so-called phase four trial. Those are trials that are usually done after the drug is approved, after marketing. And those trials look at very specific subgroups or follow very spe specific side effects. But it's not necessarily something that you as a patient in the process of gynecologic cancer treatment might necessarily would be facing. So when you select trials, look very carefully at what phase this trial is in. Now, what do you benefit from or by participating in clinical trials? Well, first of all, you get a very, very early access to new treatments, particularly in the phase one and two trials. And that means you can potentially be one of the first patients that benefits from a new drug. Of course, there's never a guarantee, as I showed you, but that could very well happen. You also will experience that we will closely follow up with you and much closer than you see in a regular follow-up on the standard therapy. The protocols really demand us to have more frequent blood tests, more frequent imaging studies, more frequent visits with your physician and with our clinical trial coordinators. And after all, partic participation in any trial, diagnostic, screening, or treatment trial, will ultimately advance our medical knowledge, even if the trial at the end does not turn out what it might have promised at the beginning, meaning being negative. There are also risk of clinical trials. You can have unexpected side effects, and they can happen in any phase of these trials. Even if you think a drug is well tolerated in phase one, enrolling more patients in phase two and three might show you side effects that you didn't see and anticipate before. Also have to consider that new treatments are not always better. They might sound good, and they might be based on a better biological rationale, but they might not show the clinical efficacy that we all want. And if a drug works for one person or one patient, it might not work for everybody. Consider also the additional cost. Some of them for you might, as a patient, relate to traveling to our sites where we do these trials, particularly patients that come from remote area. For those patients, it might be a significant additional cost that is not necessarily covered by the trialists or by the insurance company. There are patients that uh, don't necessarily want to participate in clinical trials. There are physicians that don't think the patients should participate in clinical trials. Yet, it's very important as an adult to think about this proactively. We think that physicians oftentimes lack knowledge of appropriate trials, and that's something that I think transcends to all physicians' areas. It is difficult to know the always changing landscape of different clinical trials and approaches, and I'll show you in a few slides what I mean by this. You have to consider that the clinical trial requires a lot of support staff and physician involvement. We have the luxury really at Stanford to be extremely well supported but this is not necessarily the case in a peripheral center of care. Some physicians do, do not want to give up control of the patient's care because it is much about the relationship between physician and the patient that guides their recommendations. And some physicians are even a little concerned about how a patient might react to their suggestion to go on a clinical trial, meaning that might put them in a place where they have less hope for a better outcome. On the patient side, there's also a lack of knowledge of clinical trials, and we are working very hard on improving, um, improving this. There's lack of access to clinical trials. If you live out remotely from Stanford and uh, it takes you hours to get here, it's difficult to first know about trials and then second to get to the site where you can have those um, conducted. Some patients actually prefer the physicians to make the treatment choices. They have a good physician-patient relationship, and they feel like the physician knows the best what is the best for them. Some patients are suspicious, are suspicious of research, don't want to be used as research objects, and that's, again, something we're really trying to change. Our trials 
are very well watched and safety is our one priority. Some patients, as I said, have logistic and personal obstacles to participate in clinical trials, and again, something that we're working hard on improving. Now, what does it mean to open a cancer study? And I'm going to show you on the next slide a flowchart which uh, will be extremely detailed and complex. It'd be easy to take a drug where we think it works great in animals, so why not put this in human beings and write a prescription just like for every other drug? Well, you can't do this in clinical trials because you have to go through a number of regulatory approval processes. And this is a flowchart that I think is very, very impressive, well put together by the cancer, uh, Stanford Cancer Institute. And a lot of these um, processes have to be in place in order to get a drug to the patient. It can take a while. And that's why some of you might have experienced frustration waiting for a study to open. And that's the reason why. Now, we are most, I think, involved in most trials. Uh, we have to involve what's called the IRB and the SRC at Stanford. This is shown in the gray box, which I'm going to focus in right now. It's called the Institutional Review Board and the Scientific Research Committee. Those are really the two very important local boards and committees that need to look at the trial. So what does the IRB do? The IRB is a committee those are physicians, scientists, statisticians, even lay people that is formally designated to approve, monitor, and review research involving humans. And their primary concern is to assure that the patient doesn't experience any physical or psychological harm. So the safety of patient is very, very important to this committee. It also makes sure that patients are fully informed and uh, can voluntarily participate in this clinical trial. There's absolutely no obligation for any patient to consent to a trial unless they're completely informed about this. And we do this, I think, extremely well at Stanford that we go into all great details in uh, informing patients about the risks and benefits, the rationale of our trials. Scientific Review Committee, the SRC, is yet another committee, different personnel. And this committee primarily focuses on the scientific review, the scientific merit. Is it feasible to do the study here at Stanford or in the environment? And how are cancer center resources utilized? You have to consider that every trial needs um, a certain number of tests. Can we do these tests here at Stanford? Can we provide the imaging studies? And uh, does the study actually make scientific sense? Please. They, they do review mostly cancer trials, that's correct. Um, the IAB, they review basically all trials that have to do with cancer here because we are a National Cancer Institute uh, designated um, by the NCI, the National Cancer Institute. So it's a requirement here at Stanford to have that. IAB, there's medical IABs that review all other trials, including cancer trials. Now, what does a clinical research coordinator do? I mentioned those before. Those really are the people that do our work. And they're involved from study conception, here on the left side. They monitor all study activities, from consent form to screening to finding patients. They're managers that facilitate the study contact. They document very carefully. And a lot of time goes into documentation nowadays of side effects, doses given, and timing. They're also involved in the regulatory processes with not only the IRB and the SSC, but also the FDA if that's required. And then last but not least, have to be concerned about the finances of each trial. Trials are very expensive. And we get support by the companies that want to develop their drugs. We get support by the National Institutes of Health or the National Cancer Institute. We have some investigated initial trials that are supported by grants and also support by the Stanford Cancer Institute. We do philanthropy even to support our trials. So the resources come really out of all directions, but it has to fit financially. We have very special um, fees for research-related studies, so they're not charged at the same level as uh, the insurance companies are being charged for approved procedures and uh, non-research activities, so standard treatment, but still Doing a budget for these trials is extremely important and necessary. 
So here is our clinical research group. Again, we have Ashley Powell, who leads this all, Bela, Shah, Sharanya Ram, Susan Friedrich, who does a lot of our cooperative group studies. So there's groups in the United States, like the Gynecologic Oncology Group, that organizes only clinical trials in oncology. And then Alma Gonzalez just um, joined us more recently. Alma is going to be primarily responsible for investigated initiative trial, meaning if I, if I have a good idea for a trial, it's approved through this entire network of uh, um, regulatory processes. Alma will be responsible for these type of trials. If you have any questions, here's a phone number. Please use this and call us for any detailed information. So how do you find clinical trials at Stanford and beyond? And I do know for a fact that I have multiple conversations every week with patients on that particular topic. It's not easy. It's not easy for us physicians either, but I show you a couple of resources that I think are uh, very, rather easy to navigate and very, very uh, resourceful. The first one is our website from the Cancer Institute. This is what it looks like when you go to cancer.stanford.edu. This here is, uh, as you probably know, the entrance to the Cancer Treatment Center with the fountain in front. It has, right in the middle, a option to look for clinical trials. So let me click on the clinical trials, and I find a site that looks like this, Find Cancer Clinical Trials. And those are all the clinical trials that are going on at Stanford at any given time. You can look by keyword, you can look by condition, you can look by drug use. You can also look by what's called the eligibility flowchart, shown here on the right side, which allows you to enter more specifics about your condition. For example, have you had chemotherapy before? What is your condition? What is your disease? Is it ovarian cancer, cervical cancer? What kind of chemotherapy did you have before? And if you put these parameters in, it will more specifically look for a clinical trial. Now let's say I look for trials that uh, involve ovarian cancer patients. I type this keyword in here. I look for trials that are accepting patients. Some of the trials are registered, might not be open yet, or might not be recruiting patients anymore. But the ones that are accepting patients are six of them. And this is shown now on the next side when I click in this. And as you go through these studies, you see the title of them. Now, the first study that comes up here, and that's I know how to read from the uh, very end of the room, is a maintenance study with niraparib, a PARP inhibitor, compared to placebo in patients with platinum-sensitive ovarian cancer. So I know now it's an ovarian cancer study. I know it's for platinum-sensitive patients, and I know it's a placebo-controlled trial where the drug to be studied is a PARP inhibitor. Now, when you click on that title here, it goes to, goes to the next website, and that's probably easier to read from the end of the room, but here's a much more detailed description, and you can read this. So I know now those are patients that have BSCA mutations or tumors with high-grade serous histology, and if you happen to know this information, you know as a patient I might be a candidate for the trial if I'm interested in it. Again, if you have questions, there's always a primary contact, in this case, Ashley Powell again, and if you pick up the phone, call her number, you can discuss this trial with her on the phone. There's more on this website. As you scroll further down, you're getting down to the inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria, something you might want to read at home. It shows again that, uh, that you have uh, to have either high-grade, serious ovarian cancer or have a BSCA mutation. You also find out that um, you cannot have had invasive cancer other than ovarian cancer within two years prior to enrollment in the trial. So there's some exclusion criteria that you might want to look at. Now, this is often really written in very medical terms, but again, for any questions, it's a quick phone call, and we can clarify anything you want to know. Now, don't forget that all gynecologic malignancies are so-called solid tumors. That's compared to leukemias that are more blood tumors. Solid tumors can also be subsumized as clinical trials. And if you look for solid tumors on the Stanford website, you find 30 trials. 
And each one of those trials, you could be a potential candidate for. It might not be a trial for gynecologic cancer primarily, but since it's for solid tumors, the investigators of these trials might be very open to consider you as a candidate for this trial. Now here I pull up one of them. This is a study that is done by Dr. Ron Levy, who is uh, certainly one of the most accomplished investigators at Stanford. He's the one who developed rituximab. Here he uses a drug that's called urilumab. It's an immunotherapy drug that stimulates the immune system. And as I boxed here, it does enroll subjects with advanced and or metastatic solid tumors, which the gynecologic malignancies are. So if you happen to not find a trial for ovarian cancer that fits you, look for these trials. They're usually phase one trials, sometimes phase two trials. They're trying to find a target for this drug or a disease for this drug where this drug has some efficacy. That's why they're enrolling all solid tumor models. So don't forget about looking for solid tumor as your keyword. I'm also introducing now uh, the Stanford Cancer Institute Clinical Trial Application. There's an app that you can download easily on your smartphone. This is what the icon is going to look like, SCI Clinical Trials. It's really easy to navigate. It's just like the website I just showed you, a way of searching for clinical trials. You can do this by conditions. We'll get you to the clinical research coordinator that you may call for um, additional information. Please use this and please use it if you're a patient interested in clinical trials. Often clinical trials are subject to change. We open and close them very, very quickly. And I think that looking at this site um, on a regular basis, about once a month, might make some sense for you. So this is a really easy way to do all of this on your iPhone or iPad. Uh, we also have people in the Central uh, Clinical Trials Office that give you information referral. I have Alan DiNucci, who is here in the audience, who is really a fabulous clinical trials recruitment specialist. And if you call Alan, she will guide you through clinical trials and provide you information about any related resources. I think you should take advantage of this um, for any trials. This is not only gynecologic cancer trials, but for any cancer trials going on at the Stanford Cancer Institute. We have also a Spanish-speaking person for anybody who prefers to communicate in Spanish. This is Adriana Morieco. She really makes sure that our trials are diverse and offer these services to our Spanish-speaking population. We do have Asian interpreters, as you probably know from our clinics, that can facilitate translation of our conversation with the patient about clinical trials. I don't think we have anybody right now dedicated in the Stanford Cancer Institute for that purpose. Ellen, correct me if I'm wrong. But we have this available. So, so don't feel like you're left out if you speak a different language. We will make sure you get the information that you need. Now, another website that I find extremely useful is this one, clinicaltrials.gov. It's actually a service of the U.S. National Institute of Health. And that's a very, very comprehensive website. And if you can read this from there, they right now have 183,000 studies listed. Not all of them are recruiting. It's not all cancer. But, and it's not all going on in the United States, but a significant proportion of those studies are in cancer, are recruiting, and are done very close to our home. You can use a study and this uh, website as well. And uh, as we look for ovarian cancer, recruiting studies, all studies that are interventional, it will pull up a very similar list of uh, studies where I find 458 ovarian cancer studies all around the world that are currently recruiting patients. And, uh, I didn't do this on purpose, but the same study that we had just opened on the Stanford Cancer Institute website, the neuroparate PARP inhibitor study, shows up here as the first study. You can click on this title here, and uh, very similar to what we provide you at the Stanford website, it will pull up very detailed information. Read that detailed information. It goes further down on the website. It gives you context. It also gives you centers where these trials are done. And the centers might be closer to where you might want to go as a patient. It might not be necessarily Stanford, but other institutions closer to home. 
you might also consider this website as a resource for other trials that are not even done at the RESCO, but I think preferentially you want to stay close to home to facilitate and make it easy for you to follow all trial procedures. And that's what I want to show you here. This website will give you the option to look for trials that are very specific. If you want to look for a trial in California, it allows you to do this here. In this case, I look for ovarian cancer recruiting trials, phase three, so large studies, only in California. And I find a total of uh, nine trials here. Again, for some reason, we get the same trial on the very top in the rubber rib and uh, others that you might be interested in. Um, of course, you're welcome to travel to other sites, but I think um, given that involvement in clinical trials requires a lot of follow-up, it might be impractical to travel too far off a distance. So this was finding clinical trials at Stanford and beyond, and I hope you'll use this resource if you need this as a patient. We are happy to talk to you about clinical trials that you find on these websites and you find interesting because a lot of the decision-making process really depends on what your physician or we as a group of gynecologic oncologists, oncologists think um, about these type of approaches. Not every trial we think has a lot of validity, but uh, a lot of them I think do have the value. And I show you now in the last section of my talk what I think are some of these promising new treatment strategies for our patients. Now, I'm going to talk about targeting specific cancer growth pathway, PARP inhibitors, and immunotherapy. There's, of course, other strategies you can talk about, but uh, I think in the interest of time, I will focus on these three different areas. So let's start with targeting specific cancer growth pathways. We know a lot more about the biology of cancer than ever before nowadays. There are giant databases all around the world, including from Stanford, that have elucidated a lot of the molecular structures, pathways, ways that um, cancer cells are using to grow. So we went from just taking a tumor out from a patient, they could put this under the light microscope and tell uh, us and tell you, well, this is a cancer from the cervix or the uterus or the ovary. They can do a very sophisticated study, including electron microscopy, which we're not using clinically, but down to molecular analysis. We can look at gene mutations, we can look at protein, and we can get much more sophisticated. It then turns out to be a very complex network of genes and proteins that is extremely important for the cancer cell to grow. A cancer cell looks very different compared to a normal cell. The big challenge nowadays is which one of these many pathways is really important to the cancer cell? Which switch do I have to turn off to kill this cell? And here, we, I think, have made at least some progress. And I just want to show you what areas I think might be promising. Cancers have a lot of different mutations. And here's a study that was published about a couple of years ago by Bert Fogelstein, who looked at all kinds of different cancers. And he basically asked, how many mutations do you actually find in the DNA of these different cancers? And this chart on the left side shows you that every cancer has a different number of mutations. And it ranges anywhere from only four in this very rare raptoid childhood cancer. Lung cancer has a lot of them, 163, and some colorectal cancer even more than that. Ovarian cancer at this point was kind of in the middle, but as the days and weeks go by, we do actually find more and more mutations. The problem for us is which ones are the really important mutations? Which ones are the mutations that we should design drugs for? And you pick your choices here. But we have, I think, identified a few. And I show you some very important mutations here. This is a different way of looking at ovarian cancer. We used to, and still do, look under the microscope and say, well, this is an ovarian cancer of the epithelial subtype. It's either high-grade serous or low-grade. It's a mucinous, clear cell, or endometrial cancer. And some of them are not epithelial. They're called sex caused tumors, cell tumors, or germ cell tumors. Now, I want to direct your attention to the genes that are most frequently mutated in these histological subgroups. And I want you to recognize that these genes are a little different. When you look at the high grade serous ovarian cancer, this TP53, a very important tumor suppressor gene, 
is mutated in the vast majority of them. And uh, so are the BSEA1 and 2 genes. They're most frequently mutated in this histological subtype. Other cancers have low-grade mutations in very different genes. Listed here are BRAF, KRAS, NRAS, and ERP2. And yet, clear cell carcinomas, endometrial, endometrial carcinomas have mutations very frequently in what we call the PR3 kinase pathway. So you start seeing certain subgroup of cancers that we don't divide anymore by histological subtype or what the pathology, pathologist thinks is the epithelial subtype, but rather by the mutation spectrum. And that is exactly the information that we want to use to design new targeted therapies. Here is what we call the Stanford Molecular Profiling. It just came out. And that's a uh, mutation panel of right now 198 genes. We have rolled this out in lung cancer. We're starting to do this in gynecologic cancers. I do know that a lot of other companies as Foundation Medicine or Foundation One and Clarity Foundation will provide you with that very same information. Uh, but it's important for us to get this information from your tumors particularly at some point of the treatment where we're looking for different treatment choices. There's a lot of genes here, and we let get a lot of information out of this. We don't know exactly how to use this information absolutely correctly these days, but we know some. Here, for example, is what we call the PR3 kinase pathway. And I don't want to take you through all the entire biology here, but in essence, if you follow my cursor, you have a cell membrane here. These cells, these the cancer cells, get activated at the cell membrane level, and then a enzyme cascade, so to speak, does signal into the cell via a number of different proteins. And that signaling cascade ultimately at the very bottom leads to increased growth of the cells, increased meta metastasis, increased metabolism. So you make the cell more aggressive. Now, since we know about all, a lot of these different proteins in this pathway, we can design drugs that block these proteins because if we switch this pathway off, the cells are deprived of a very important growth pathway, and we can do this nowadays with certain drugs. We have a clinical trial here in gynecologic malignancy. It doesn't really matter which one it is that inhibits this protein. It's called AKT, and the drug that we have available is AZD. 5363, it's a catchy name, isn't it? But this is a phase one study. The drugs are not named in these phases usually. If we inhibit this AKT protein in patients whose tumors have an activated pathway, and that is those tumors that have mutations in these genes like PSV kinase or AKT, we might see under tumor effects. And this is where your mutation panel becomes so important because we can consider you a candidate for this particular drug if we can demonstrate the presence of these mutations. If you're, not, if you're not a candidate for the trial in particular, they are now approved what we call mTOR inhibitors that do inhibit this complex shown down on the right side. And I have a number of patients on mTOR inhibitors that have shown by mutation profiling that the pathway is activated and it works in some of our patients. So it's an off-label uh, use of the drug in gynecologic malignancy. And I think that if you look for clinical trials that um, are based on mutation in the PR3 kinase pathway and a drug that targets one of these mutations, I think there is some good evidence that uh, you get some efficacy from these type of interventions. Another pathway at the MAP kinase pathway, I know that goes again deep into pathology and biology, but there's another protein cascade. Here again is the outside of the cancer cell. It signals into the cell by different proteins like RAS, MAC, MAP, kinase, ERK, and ultimately again increases the growth of the cell metastatic profile. Now what if we inhibit one of the central proteins? We just take out one of these enzymes and the cell is deprived of this, path, this pathway. We have a drug in clinical trial now. It's called trametinib. And particularly for those patients that have what we call a low-grade serous ovarian cancer, these drugs might be efficient because these low-grade serous ovarian cancers use this pathway to grow. Again, that's a trial that has started, and if you 
our patient that faces the issue of having to come up with an alternative treatment for low-grade serous ovarian cancer, trametinib might actually be a good choice for you. The second principle I want to talk about, and I know a lot of you know about these drugs, is targeting the cancer cells that are defective in DNA repair mechanisms. DNA is the essence of the cells. It makes all the proteins or provides the information to make all the proteins. DNA is damaged by chemotherapy and radiation. The golden sun damages the DNA. A normal cell can very well repair its DNA, and it ends up surviving any damage and grow. Now, a cancer cell often has a defective DNA repair mechanism. And upon radiation and chemotherapy, it dies, and that's why at least partially, chemotherapy and radiation is more selectively killing cancer cells rather than normal cells. Now, if in addition to being a cancer cell with already defective DNA repair, these cells are deficient in BRCA1 or 2, they have another hit against them because those BRCA1 or 2 proteins are much involved in DNA repair. So patients whose tumors have a BRCA deficiency because of a mutation those tumors don't have a great ability to repair their DNA uh, damage upon treatment with chemotherapy. And that's why patients that have BSA mutations in general respond better to chemotherapy and have a better outcome. But we can use this to our advantage by inhibiting yet another enzyme in the DNA repair pathway called POP. It's a long name, poly-ADP ribose polymerase, but it's an important enzyme and a lot of inhibitors are now studied to inhibit this enzyme. If you do it in patients that have a BRCA mutation background, the efficacy is rather impressive. And I'll show you this in a moment. There's a number of different drugs. Um, the ones mentioned here, Olaparib, Niraparib, Rucaparib, and Rolaparib. I know it's a very different language, but all of those four we have used here at Stanford, we have from the very first beginning of the development of these drugs, put a lot of emphasis on getting this to our patients, and actually it has shown some very interesting, promising results. And I'll show you one of these studies here. This is a study out of the uh, European literature. Here are patients that um, had relapsed ovarian cancer. They were treated with platinum agents and had a good response. And then they were given this olaparib drug, the, the PARP inhibitor. And uh, this is what we call a Kaplan-Meier curve here. Up on top is shown the patient's survival that have BSA mutations, and that was an average of about 11 to months of uh, progression-free survival. That's the time that the disease doesn't get worse. And when you look at the patients um, that got the placebo, their survival was less favorable with about 4.3 months progression-free survival. So a rather large difference for us. This uh, was not the data that the FDA ever used to approve for Laparib a few months ago. It was this data here, just published in January 2015, so a few weeks ago, in uh, the Journal of Clinical Oncology. This is a study that used patients with BSA mutations, as you can see on the left side of the table. Uh, they had mostly BSA1 mutation, but also BSA2 mutation, and one patient with two mutations. They had a mean of 4.3 prior regimens prior chemotherapies, and that's a lot, four different chemotherapy agents. Those patients are very difficult to treat with any drug. But in BSCA mutation carriers, there was a 31% tumor response rate. There were about six out of 60 patients here that had complete response, complete disappearance of all tumor, and 54 patients out of 60 that had at least a partial response. And that related in actually a progression-free survival of about seven months, which in this population, compared to historical controls, meaning other trials they've done prior, is actually about three months better than we have seen before. This was not a trial that compared it to anything else. This was just a single-agent trial. But the FDA was convinced that this was actually very promising, and we can now get our patients that had at least three prior or four chem chemotherapies prior, this drug approved and uh, treated with. So again, as I said, at Stanford, we have a lot of interest in further developing these PARP inhibitors. 
We have a number of trials going on that use all of these drugs. Um, keep in touch with us about what we open and uh, what is closing, what is available. And uh, this recruitment is actually at Stanford going very well. There's great interest. If you don't find PARP inhibitors at Stanford, then please look around. There's a lot of institutions that have them now in clinical trials. In the last uh, section, I want to actually focus on immunotherapy, something that is very much in vogue nowadays because it has shown great promises in other tumor models, including melanoma and lung cancer, some of the data you're probably aware of. Now, the immune system is very complex. And I'll show you here how we look at this as uh, the innate immunity on the left side, a lot of cells that are part of the rapid response, as we call it. So if uh, you have a cancer cell, a virus, bacteria, anything foreign to the body, these cells get on site and uh, try to fight the foreign invaders. And the other side is the adaptive immunity, and this is really a slow response that the body has to learn. So it has to learn how these invaders, cancer cells, look like, and then make either antibodies against them via B cells or make specific T cells against cancer cells. And CD8 positive T cells, for example, we call cytotoxic T cells, and those are extremely effective against cancer cells. And I'll show you how we, we will use this in uh, clinical trials here. There's been a lot of excitement about modifying T cells from patients, reinfusing them into the patients, and then seeing really fabulous, unprecedented under tumor effects in uh, particularly lymphoma, and now we're seeing this in other uh, more solid malignancies as well. So there's an innate immunity, an adaptive immunity, and we are really have made progress understanding these type of interactions with tumor cells in uh, the patients. Now, how does actually a cancer stimulate an under-tumor response? And if you follow me here, here it uh, releases a certain protein. The cancer cells do expose certain proteins to the immune system. These proteins and products of the cancer cells can travel to the local lymph nodes. And they do this via specialized cells. And what happens to the lymph nodes, they show themselves to the immune system. And as they do this, they activate certain what we call T cells again and other cells. And these T cells are then released in the systemic bloodstream. And in their bloodstream, they find tumor tissue. And at the tumor site, they can potentially kill the tumor cells because they activate it against the tumor. They have learned how the tumor, what the tumor looks like. Now, that in theory works very well. And although we find a lot of T cells when you look into a tumor, Unfortunately, these T cells are prevented from doing the killing. And there's a lot of different ways that these cancer cells have found to prevent um, them from being killed by the immune system. And I've mentioned a few here. The most interesting approaches now pertain to the PD-1 and PD-L1 axis. And I'll show you this in a moment here. As I said, cancer cells block the surrounding immune effector cells. As I said, in the tumor environment, a lot of natural killer cells, T cells, and macrophages. But these cancer cells have all these stop signals around them. And the T cells and macrophages just can't get to them. Now, what are these stop signals? One that uh, was very much developed here at Stanford and studied now in a clinical trial is called CD47. CD47 sits on tumor cells. And it prevents what we call macrophages that are very, very able to digest tumor cells to do their job. So they sit there, but they can't do what they're supposed to do, eat the tumor cells, because of CD47. So if you block CD47, you might activate these macrophages. The same is true for the other axis that I just mentioned, the PDL1 or PD1 axis. PDL1 is expressed on the tumor cells, and it stops the T cells from working. Now, how does it work here in a more scientific cartoon? Again, pd one is on the tumor cells and PD-1 on the T cells. When these two molecules connect, you see a decrease in the activation of the T cells. It just blocks it. So it makes sense to design molecules against this interaction. And uh, we now have a number of inhibitors against either PD-1 or PDL one And if you interrupt that interaction between these two molecules, the T cells and the tumor cells, 
the T cells are not inactivated anymore and can actually kill those tumor cells. And the process is much more complicated, but this is a, a simple view of how we think the inhibition might actually get us um, to have activated T cells. We call those immune checkpoint inhibitors. The uh, pharmaceutical industry is very active these days to develop a number of different compounds. I show you names of these here. Nivolumab, uh, Pembolizumab, those are drugs that were early in development by um, Bristol-Myers Scripps, for example. Um, there's others that are direct against PDL1. A lot of very promising data. I'll show you some of this promising data here. This is a study that was uh, done at UCLA by Tony Rebus and others. This is a PD-1 inhibitor, lambolizumab, in melanoma. And in the cohort of 135 patients, the response rate, this is recurrent melanoma, was about 38% and the highest dose 52%. So a tremendous, really never seen before response to a drug in solid tumors. And more importantly, the response was rather durable. The median progression-free survival was longer than seven months. In a separate trial that used nivolumab, another PD-1 inhibitor, this was published about a year ago in melanoma, 107 patients. Again, a median overall survival of 16.8 months response rates or one and two year survival rates of 62 and 43 percent. Those are very advanced melanoma patients. And even more important was the fact that even if you stop the treatment, the effect continued. So for some reason, inhibiting the, inhibiting the immune checkpoint led to an education of the immune system that lasted for a long period of time. So these patients are continued to be followed. You see in the last few months a, a rather large number of <coughs> other trials coming out that show that this indeed is an extremely promising approach. It works particularly well in melanoma lung cancer and renal cancer, but we think it might also work in other cancers like gynecologic malignancy, or van cancer, for example. Here shown are some previous studies. On the left upper corner is a slide that shows you that we find in brown a lot of T cells in ovarian cancer, but they can't do their job because they're inhibited. In the lower left panel here is shown expression of PDL1 and 2, there's two different forms of that, in ovarian cancer. And if you have a high expression of PDL1 in your tumor, you don't do that well. Your prognosis is worse. And that really fits the concept of this protein inhibiting a local immune response. Now, we don't have a lot of data in gynecologic malignancies yet. We are starting to study this. But here is one example out of uh, Japan where they used nivolumab in a platinum resistant of cancer. This is a clear cell carcinoma. And I want to show you that these masses here that you see circled on the CT scan right above the kidneys, they're about six centimeters in size, they disappear completely when you treat the patient with nivolumab. So at six centimeters before treatment, and then at day 79 and 123, there's still no sign of recurrent disease. This is one of these cancers that, as I said, is extremely difficult to treat, but this drug seem to have made a big difference for the patient. You also see a drop with the CN25 down to a very normal value below 35. In addition to this, this was actually a long-lasting response. Now those are single patients still, but I think we need to get these drugs into gynecologic cancers. And if you look for drugs out there for your particular situation, look for PD PD-1 and pd one inhibitors. They're often now used in combination with other drugs but I think here's an area that we need to focus on. There's also a way of redirecting the immune system against cancers. And here's a T cell that uh, seems to make contact with a cancer cell. And as it does this, it recognizes the cells and can potentially kill it. Now, how do we get a T cell to recognize a cancer cell and kill it? Now, cancer cells have certain proteins on them. They're called antigens. They can be very specific or not so specific, meaning they're not only expressed on cancer cells, but maybe even on normal cells. But the T cell doesn't necessarily know what to look for un unless we instruct it. And we have now ways of doing this by modifying genetically the T cells with a T cell receptor. We're using viruses for this. We take the T cells from the patients. We 
infect them with the retrovirus that genetically modifies those T cells. And when they're re-injected into the patient, these T cells circulate to the tumor cells. They recognize the tumor cells and hopefully kill them. And this is what we call the adoptive T cell therapy that's been so much in the news in the last few months. Again, we're just starting to do this in ovarian cancers and gynecologic malignancy. It's been done in CD19 positive T cell lymphomas in a similar way. We're rolling out a number of trials here at Stanford which will investigate this principle. And I think here is an approach that, again, is extremely promising. What antigen should be targeted in ovarian cancer? We have one that we're going to start with. It's called the NYE1 antigen. The reason why we like it is because it's not expressed on normal tissue expressed in the normal ovary, but it's not so much of an issue in ovarian cancers. Otherwise, it's really specific for cancer cells, and that's why it's a good target for us. Again, it's a, a simple design. Blood sample is taken. The T cells are extracted. They're genetically modified in the laboratory, and then a few days later, go back to the patient. It's not quite as simple because you also have to give the patient chemotherapy to suppress their own immune system. Otherwise, these cells will not take very well. It will disappear very quickly. So I want to show you in uh, the last couple of slides that we have a number of trials open here right now. Again, call Ashley, Sharanya, Bela. They will give you more information. We have PARP inhibitor trials open. We have trametinib open that is in low-grade serious ovarian cancer, as I showed you, does uh, inhibit the BAP a MAP kinase pathway. We have a new drugs here that uh, do prevent, uh, hopefully, stem cells from signaling. It's called OMP54F28. It's a phase one, two trial. And then, uh, again, Rucuparib for the treatment of platinum-sensitive disease. Um, they're relapsed after three, but no, not more than four lines of chemotherapy. So that's for ovarian cancer. We have currently one trial for endometrial cancer that will investigate whether metformin it's usually a drug called a uh, uh, um, uh, use for uh, diabetic patients, makes a difference when added to standard chemotherapy. And then, as I mentioned before, an AKT inhibitor in patients that have an activated PR3 kinase pathway. And we do this in different malignancies, women's cancer, ovarian, endometrial, cervical, and breast cancer. But it does require that the profile for your tissue, your tumor tissue, for the presence of certain mutations. We have in work a number of trials for this year, and again, my research group is working very actively of opening a number of trials, so stay tuned. We're going to put them on the website. Uh, again, I'm particularly excited about the adoptive T cell therapy that targets certain specific antigens, and hopefully we'll have this available for you in the very near future. So in summary, um, I think uh, that uh, I hopefully have shown you that the clinical trials for cancer are carefully designed studies in human subjects that assess an intervention that will ultimately provide a greater benefit to the patient compared to existing therapy. That's really our goal. It should be more efficacious. We should be able to improve the prognosis of the patient, give them longevity for, with a good quality of life. I think, again, that the Cancer Institute here at Stanford has done a fabulous job providing you with access to information about clinical trials via the website and the app for your iPhones, and that the nihclinicaltrials.gov websites uh, provide excellent resources if you want to look for trials at Stanford and beyond, even worldwide. As I said, I think some of the promising developments for gynecologic cancers and for other cancers come from targeted therapies, for example, targeting PR3 kinase and MAP kinase pathway, POP inhibitors, and immunotherapy. If you have a question, and I know that gets very complicated, please don't hesitate to call us for advice and information. This talk will be available on YouTube, so you can review it if you like to and at least get the pertinent information. Uh, I want to point out that this is not possible without the help of many people here shown as the Stanford Cancer Institute executive team, uh, which is really um, headed and much supported by our dean, Dr. Lloyd Miner, and also Beverly Mitchell, the director of the Can Stanford Cancer Institute. This can only work with a big support of everybody that works together here at Stanford. 
I want to particularly also acknowledge the people that I worked with more closely at the Stanford Women's Cancer Center. This is Dr. Jonathan Berg, the chairman, who wanted to be here tonight but has a different commitment. Catherine Bailey, who runs all the cancer care programs, and then our faculty here. I think you have seen enough of me tonight, but this is Dr. Alma Karam, who is uh, an excellent gynecologic oncologist has a uh, focus on robotic surgery, but also developed on the clinical trials. Dr. Nelson Tang, who is a very established figure here, a very experienced gynecologic oncologist, Dr. Shannon McLaughlin, all of us are very happy to talk to you about clinical trials and your, enroll you in those. And uh, likewise, our Bridget Miralda and Arthi, who are both excellent nurse practitioners and are very happy to talk to you about any sort of questions that you might have about clinical trials in our division at, at the Stanford Women's Cancer Center. So I'm going to close it up with a couple of pictures. Here it is, the Stanford Women's Cancer Center and the Stanford Cancer Institute. This is where we treat our patients. This, of course, is a beautiful picture of our campus. And I uh, um, want to thank you again for being in attendance tonight. And I'm happy to answer, answer question, any questions that you might have. Thank you. at those inclusion and exclusion criteria in self-identifying uh, and, 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 and calling the, 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 your center? So it's a very good question. You know, how can, well can you read the inclusion exclusion criteria? I think a lot depends on how much a patient knows, how medically informed they are. The second issue pertains to how well they are written. Some of them are written in you guys can confirm this in very medical terms, and then become so technical that it does really require a phone call. I would recommend that before you think you're not a candidate for the trial, call us and ask us, because some of the things that are written in those criteria, criteria might be misunderstood. Some of this also pertains to certain laboratory values that you might not know as a patient. And again, that requires another blood test or requires another imaging studies. Um, a lot of our studies need what we call measurable disease. We want to see on CT scan some mass, some lesion that we can follow. Let's say there's a three centimeter nodule in the pelvis. Some, a lot of trials have the requirement to have such a measure or a nodule available. And uh, when you enroll, you need to show a CT scan or actually do a CT scan that measures this. And you can follow this with CT scan over time. And that's not necessarily information you, that you have a patient might have you in your hands. Does that make sense? In terms of calling, I think PA patients are very good about calling us, getting the information, we're trying to provide them into inf any information they, uh, uh, they, they need for getting um, where they need to be. Um, I think the websites uh, are very useful at least to find trials. And the algorithms, I encourage you to use those as well, where you type in very specific information about your particular situation, and it will channel down on the many, many trials that you can choose from. Any other questions? I we're always here for you. I mean, we have, I think, uh, our phone numbers everywhere. Um, you can also reach us via email. So uh, if there's no other questions, then thank you everybody for attending tonight and uh, hope you have a good way home.